Well, Professor Sachs, um, let's talk a bit about China-U.S. relations because, you know, China is the big stakeholder in this. But despite rising geopolitical tensions, the Chinese and the U.S. economies remain closely interdependent. There are $700 billion of trade and there are $250 billion of U.S. investment in China and China is also the second largest holder of U.S. treasuries. But there is so much misunderstanding. There are even views in the U.S. that China may weaponize this holding of U.S. treasuries. Does it make any sense of you, to you? Because, because the stability of the U.S. financial markets is in the interest of China. All of this uh, uh, tension results, uh, in my view, from China's success, uh, especially China's success uh, over the last 20 years. China's had remarkable 40 years of economic uh, development that's unprecedented uh, in how successful. But in the last 20 years, China became uh, very successful in high technology in a number of areas. And this is what uh, uh, caused panic even among uh, American uh, strategists. Not economists, by the way. The economists are pretty calm about this. Mm. Uh, but it's uh, those that are in the Pentagon or in the security services. I don't think like they do. Uh, I like China's prosperity very much. And uh, I think Thank there's a, enough room in the world for everybody to be prosperous. And I believe in common prosperity. But when mm. you're a military strategist, you don't care about common prosperity. You care about who's number one, which is, to my mind, a, a wrong question to begin with and a very dangerous perspective, because then you're fighting against the success of someone else. And it came to American politics in the last 10 years that we need to fight against China's success. Well, that's a terrible idea, a very dangerous idea. But I know that some American strategists or politicians believe in it. I think they're fools, frankly, if I could use a very strong term, because it's absolutely reckless and when we're trained as economists, we think win-win. But when you're a military strategist, you might think win-lose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe we should be aiming for win-win solutions, uh, which I firmly believe in. But this is what's wrong with the mindset right now. And I think the biggest problem is on the U.S. side, because the U.S. strategists believe in American strategic dominance. It's part of our so-called grand strategy, which is a big term to mean a kind of arrogance. But we need to get over that arrogance to move to a much more cooperative mindset. How to do that, my view, is basically through diplomacy and discussion, lots of discussion, lots of interaction. The idea that the United States is going to starve China's economy by cutting off semiconductors is mm -hmm. reckless and very naive, in my opinion. China will be able to find its way around uh, these uh, sanctions, and they are rather destructive of the economy at the same time. So I'm hoping that cooler heads, less panicked people, more economists believing in win-win, fewer geopolitical strategists believing in win-lose uh, come to the fore. Hmm. Professor Lee, what is your comment on this? Why do China and the U.S. have to be in this game of zero sum? Yeah, I fully we agree with Professor Sachs' uh, analysis. Let me add one, I think, simple point uh, from, uh, from China. Uh, that is, I, I do believe that uh, there is a task to be accomplished by um, by uh, scholars like me who are fortunate to be educated both in China and in the West, in my case in particular in the U.S., okay? That is to explain to the American society at large and also in particular to, to, to ordinary people on the street that China is not a mirror image of the U.S. Today's China is not 
the emerging U.S. in at the beginning of the twentieth、uh, twentieth century. Okay, so when China does not、uh, has does not have a history has history of to become a hegemony when China becomes、uh, becomes powerful. Okay, China is not a country trying to impose its political. Ideological uh, 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 belief system upon other countries, partly because partly because the Chinese political and the social political philosophies are, in my view, much more complicated to explain to、uh, to other countries. So how can we expect other countries to to follow the Chinese system? Okay. So so in this regard, I have been. Working very hard, and Jack, I need your help. I, I finished a, a, a book, and it's been in the process of being published by a U.S. publisher. I need, but、uh, I need you to、uh, to help me uh, uh, write, uh, you know, a, a few lines of endorsement. The 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 the, the, the simple line of message, the the one line message is the rise of China is good for the world. Rise of China is good for the rest of the world. is 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 not is the opposite of what is popularly perceived. I I I I meant this book to be read by the the people on the street. I I tell many stories. Of course, I also explain the big picture of the Chinese economy, so Chinese society. So Jeff, I hope I hope you can help help me in this regard. Oh, I'm I'm really excited about that because it's、uh, it's it's very important. It's the right message. Americans cannot imagine China never. Had a empire abroad. Never went for world、right. empire.、Uh, never.、Uh, China never invaded its neighbors the same way. Yet never.、Uh, I looked at two thousand years of Chinese history. China never invaded Japan, for example,、uh, except when the Mongols were briefly in charge. You know, when they tried and failed. But it's amazing. Two thousand years. And it's peace, and never in invasion. They were China was invaded the other direction, but this is something Americans can't even understand because if you look at France and England, for example, and Britain, they invaded each other so many times over a thousand years. It was almost nonstop war, and so Americans can't understand China's statecraft unless they learn more. About it and more of the history,、uh, and so your book will be very important for that. Professor Sachs, how difficult do you think it is to convey the message that China's rise is good for the U.S.? I think we need much more communication than we have right now, and it's very weird. It's you know it's so easy as we're talking right now.、Uh, we can get online and have a good conversation. But how rare this is! Actually, it's very surprising, because we should have people in Des Moines, Iowa, meeting with people in Chongqing and having a nice conversation together. We should have、uh, normal conversations between、uh, Americans and Chinese、uh, people, athletes, or people in the arts or、uh, academics, as a very routine matter.、Uh, our Students should work together on projects、uh, online in classrooms that are shared, because this is the the brilliance of of the digital age. Right. How much more we could communicate, but the communication is very low, surprisingly, and、mm. we just hear in my country. I hear stupid politicians that don't know anything about China, telling us that China is the enemy, and I hear that all the time. And these are people that I don't know if they've ever been to China once,、uh, but they are our politicians. And this, I think, is where the the uh, uh, paradox is that in an interconnected age, we don't have very many interconnections right now. And if we made more interconnections, not just business deals, but people-to-people -people understanding, this would be a huge benefit because then we could tell our politicians. In my country, calm down. Don't panic. Stop. This isn't. China's not going to take over the world or take over the United States. You can calm down, and this, I think, would be extremely important. Yeah, Jeff. Let, let, let me add. Okay, Jeff,、uh, you have been extremely successful and effective 
uh, in bringing a U.S. perspective to the Chinese audience. You are you are very popular in China, so I um, I, I admire you. I emulate. Uh, I try to emulate your your success. If I could be a fractionally successful as you are in Des Moines, uh, Iowa, <laughs> I would be very happy. Okay, I blame myself. Okay, I blame myself. I should be more active in that regard. I I do need your help. I will, I will go after you. I will send you an email after this. We're going to work on that. Thank you. Well, thanks to both of you for our, to promoting more communication between the two countries. And uh, we know uh, the world economy faces headwinds from rising U.S. interest rate and stronger dollar amid slowing growth. Uh, Professor Sachs, looking ahead, what is your econ economic outlook and what risks concern you the most? If we, if we want to have... Uh, it, good sailing on the world economy. We should uh, end the war in Ukraine mm. now through negotiation, and we should calm down the US-China tensions. If those two things happen, the world economy is going to look so much brighter than it does right now. And so these are two very practical steps. They're not even economic steps, per se. Uh, they are more geopolitical steps. But if the United States and Europe would figure out finally that they need to sit down with Russia, uh, with the government, make peace with Ukraine, U European Union, United States, Russia, to end the war, this would change things tremendously, especially in Europe, but also worldwide. And if the US and Chinese leadership would say, okay, we're going to cooperate, we're not going to uh, decouple, we're not going to threaten the world economy. This would change the business outlook tremendously. There's so much uncertainty that has been created needlessly mm. because of the tensions that this is really the key. You know, there are, of course, there are the usual economic uh, problems. There still is the instabilities that came from COVID, uh, our monetary instability right now and inflation is, is a kind of uh, uh, aftermath of monetary policies that occurred in the United States at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. But those are manageable as long as the broader framework is peaceful and cooperative. And, you know, again, the politicians are not very good at economics. The geopolitical strategists, so-called, didn't take a proper economics course. I know it in the United States. They have wrong ideas. Uh, they have win-lose ideas. Uh, so peace is really the key to making the world economy work properly. And did Professor Sachs, I know you said there is no fairy tale ending to the Ukraine crisis. In your opinion, how feasible uh, could this going to end in reality? Right now, it's extremely dangerous these days and these weeks. Uh, but there is a basic way for this war to end. At the core of this crisis was the US attempt to push its military alliance to Ukraine. And for Russia, that was a red line. We don't want NATO on our 2,000 kilometer border. And the United States said, yes, we will expand NATO to your border. And Russia said no. And that is the core of why there is a war. And what the United States needs to do, I believe, is President Biden needs to call President Putin and say, you know what, we won't extend NATO to your border. You will stop the fighting and go home. We won't uh, enter uh, into Ukraine. We'll make uh, a deal so that Ukraine becomes peaceful, neutral, and safe. And uh, on that basis, this war could end quickly, actually. But right. it takes the mindset to decide that. And incidentally, that's what would save Ukraine itself, because Ukraine is a country that is trapped in a proxy war of two superpowers. That's the worst thing to be. Yeah. You don't want to be in between two superpowers. And so Ukraine should, they don't understand it or for various political reasons, they don't accept it, but they should be the first 
to be saying, we will be neutral, we want both sides to get out so that we are neutral and safe, and that's how this war could end.